Hello, I'm Dmitry Sitkovetsky, the music director of the Greensboro Symphony, and this is Sitkovetsky and Friends virtual series sponsored by Rice Toyota. So today we have a wonderful guest familiar to the Greensboro Symphony. It's a wonderful violinist and violist, Yura Lee, who we actually find in the car now in La Jolla, California. So Yura, welcome. Welcome to the Thank program you. and tell us where you are. I hope you're not driving, but tell us where you are and what you're doing. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm safely parked. It's, it's early in the morning here. It's, it's before nine and the hall opens at nine. So I'm in La Jolla, California near San Diego and we have um, a virtual festival uh, where we're performing. Uh, we all got COVID tested among uh, the chamber music players. And we're, uh, when we got negative results, we started rehearsing within the pod and then we're streaming concerts um, in lieu of the festival uh, for this week and, and, and last week also we started rehearsing and performing. Excellent. And what's the program? What, what are you about to uh, rehearse now? Well, we started with Schubert Quintet, Cello Quintet, which was the probably the most ideal piece I could imagine in um, starting to play again after everything for me has been canceled as with uh, most people since March. So the first notes that I played since the cancellations in March was that glorious C major chord, which was, you know, the gift, complete gift. We've got amazing musicians. We've got a great uh, facility. We've got great music. Honestly, it's a it's a very it's a new normal, but it's a normal that I'm grateful to have. Wonderful, wonderful that you are able to come back to making music, live music, because I haven't had a chance because everything's, as you said, been canceled or postponed or rescheduled. And uh, all our concerts in Greensboro have been now pushed from uh, 2021 for next year. And our program where you will play uh, Mozart Symphonia Concertante with me. And then also the, of course, the great uh, Don Quixote with Zlatomir Fung, who is also uh, was with us and will be uh, shown in one of the programs. Um, Apart from that, we'll also do chamber music. That those the orchestral and the chamber program will probably be the first one because it's in January, and uh, that will be the so exciting finally to get to the Tanger Center, which been you know talked about for many many years uh, in Greensboro, and finally it's there and we could look at it, but uh, nobody's allowed to come in. <laughs> And play in there. So hopefully by January, everything will be uh, back to the new normal. Yeah, who knows what, what the new normal, but you were already experiencing. So, but it's just so exciting to, to be able to make music with, uh, you know, live, not only, I've been doing a lot of online things and which is also new and interesting experience, but uh, there's no, uh, there's no substitute for direct human contact, don't you think? Yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's, you know, there are some things that you can really try to make do with technology and there are some things that you can't, no amount of money can buy. And that is, you know, just as playing with another human being and also playing for a live audience. 
and you know it's it's uh we don't have live audiences here but just the fact that we know that some people are listening is already giving us a lot of energy and um, the fact that we can honestly play with that mask is a privilege of course we have to get tested and of course we're taking you know very safe uh very uh careful measures to not expose ourselves during the festival and for me it's worth it because uh music is the whole human being you know it's not just the the instrument it's it's not just the face but it's 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 the all the nuances that a human being exudes so i'm i'm very grateful to be able to experience this Let me just go back to our first uh, meeting. Uh, actually, it was in Germany. If you recall, I first uh, met you when you were playing the final round in Augsburg with the Bayerische Rundfunk Orchestra. And uh, you played a wonderful Mozart Fifth Concerto in major and a phenomenal Brad Bartok number two. And I was so taken by your playing that I said, oh, you must come to Greensboro and we should do a concerto, which you did a few years later. And I was absolutely sure that you had never been to Greensboro. And so I was so excited that your release coming, she's fantastic. I just mentioned you, you were in early 20s, I think at that point. And, uh, and then somebody pointed out to a picture in our office and said, but look at this picture. And I looked and there you were at the age, I think of 12, <laughs> maybe 13, that you'd actually played with the Greensboro Symphony Look before my time. And so tell me, you obviously had more than one life <laughs> in terms of concert life. And therefore it makes you somewhat really unique because clearly you were a child protege. So let's go back to really to, the, to your beginnings, to Korea. Well, I started violin very simply with Suzuki, you know, like uh, many other kids at age four. And the, one of the reasons why I started was I was just a rambunctious kid. Like my mother couldn't tell, you know, get me to sit still. My father was in the mandatory army service. She was the only caretaker with the nanny. Like I, I basically started violin so that I wouldn't break and break my head every two seconds, you know? And it was, violin and piano were the two things that kept me still. Um, and uh, I, I just kept at it, I guess. And sometimes life works in very mysterious ways where you meet a person at a certain time that introduces you to another person, you know, it's, 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 this world is very big, but also small at the same time. So my Suzuki teacher somehow, uh, the, uh, you know, we got connected with Nam Yoon Kim, the, the eminent violin uh, pedagogue in Korea who connected me to Dorothy DeLay, who, you know, it, it just, and then my father, um, when I was uh, nine years old, got a chance to be a exchange professor in New York. And lo and behold, two blocks from my apartment at that, our apartment at the time is Juilliard, you know? So how can you not go if it's only two blocks away from you? And then she connected me to Lee Lamont, who was the former president of ICM Artists. And half a year after I entered Juilliard, I had a meeting with, um, and you know, at that time, you're nine and a half years old. You don't know what music business is. I barely know now. I mean, back then, I just like playing. So if somebody tells me to play in front of somebody, I play without thinking twice about it. 
So I had my audition, which I didn't really realize it was audition. I just knew that I was getting hot chocolate after the audition. So I was excited <laughs> about that. <laughs> and because uh, I wasn't allowed sweets unless something really special happened. And then I signed with the management at age nine, apparently. And then what came after was, um, you know, concerts and more concerts and so I'm on my, I'm 35 now, so 26th year of doing this with some hi- hiatus here and there. And it's, it's you know, it, that, those were very necessary, I have to say, because a human being can, we all have the same time, amount of time in the day and a, a, amount of energy, limited resources for that. And when you are experiencing something that most kids are not experiencing out in the world and performing, then you also are losing that time to just grow up and just be a child. So I needed to kind of do the two things that I just mentioned, concerts and growing up and being a, you know, sometimes a stupid child in, in spurts. Absolutely. I had to do it sometimes also, backwards. Also communicating with your uh, classmates, you know, with your age group and just, just playing games and, 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 and reading and uh, getting to know, you know, just growing up slowly. That's, that's, that's one of the hardest things, I think, for the musicians. And I've met, uh, you know, I grew up among a lot of child prodigies back in the Central Music School in Moscow. But uh, fortunately, I wasn't one of them because I, even though uh, I'm just going, uh, we were talking before the program that I'm about to go to Prague uh, to be a judge of the competition, which I won all the way back in 1966 at the age of 12. But that does, still does not make me a child prodigy because I, it was just a competition until 16, the age of 16 was it for, the, for the young ones. So I, wa- I wouldn't be able to play the concerts that you did at nine at 12, I was not a wunderkind like you. But, you know, growing up, of course, from musical parents and going to an advanced school, of course they were. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, how come that in the last, what's your opinion? Why in the last, I would say, already maybe 20, if not 30 years, so many violinists, really accomplished violinists come from Korea, from, from South Korea, really, more than any other Asian or any other country at all, because I sit in quite a lot of competitions more and more, and there's sometimes half of the contestants are from Korea. And the name of your teacher, Nam Yoon Kim, very often figures. So tell, tell, uh, explain to me from your point of view why it is. I mean, this is an armchair theory, of course, and, 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 and just like everything, when there's a pro there's a con to something and the pro is that you know korea is a very small country wedged between china and and japan and for thousands of years it's uh we like to say we've we've uh, suffer the, the the persecution, you know, the, the invasion from the east, invasion from the west, and then it's a peninsula. So you have a, you know, basically it's it's a, it's got a lot of lament in the history. Let's put it that way, and s- s- there is with that the silver lining to that is this kind of a ridiculous amount of willpower. Let's you know that. Uh, we will persevere no matter what kind of a thing, you know. But mixed with that, I think, is this need f- and, and, and almost like a innate um, uh, instinct to express emotion. We're very emotional people. I mean, uh, you know, you uh, maybe people who don't know Kore- Koreans very well can even see from Korean dramas or, you know, it's, it's, it's a very expressive culture. Our food is very pungent. Uh, our characters are very, uh, I wouldn't say always explosive, but very strong, very concentrated amount of uh, character in there. And I'm, of course, generalizing, but it's, it's there. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah. I think it, studying music has just was sort of a mixture of both, like a mixture of being able to express yourself and a mixture of being able to stand yourself out from the crowd in, in, a, in a very specific way, in a very artistic way. Now, you see a lot of Korean violinists in competitions, and I think that competitive drive is something that is very much in there partially because we're such a small country. Mm-hmm. Of course, 
what I worry about in that regard is that I've been to many, many competitions. And I think the most important thing for me is that I remember what music is all about. We're recreating a higher form of art. So in as a definition, perhaps one could argue that the definition of competition goes directly against the purpose of art, you know, but of course we are putting ourselves out there to the judges with their subjective opinions of who's best at they think that, you know, is, is participating. So it's a complex thing that I think, you know, we are, it's, 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 it's that drive to succeed in a very concentrated small space plus the artistic drive that comes from years and years of emotional people being in a very difficult history. <laughs> That's just my armchair. No, I think it's a, it's a wonderful explanation. As, as you were explaining so eloquently, I thought of, for instance, in Europe, something like that could be said about Poland that's always been squeezed in between two giants, Russia and Germany. And it's always had, you know, a lot of troubles because of that, but the artistic sense, and you know, you have people like Chopin and, and Vinyavsky and uh, Paderewski and then Shimanovsky, and now just uh, passing uh, uh, this year, I uh, passed away way Penderecki, who I knew. I mean, giant musical figures, very, very uh, distinct uh, musical, uh, you know, culture. But politically, they've always been, you know, and that makes them, in a way, maybe more proud and more willful, as you, as you were describing, uh, uh, Koreans. And I mean, I heard the expression years ago, that uh, Koreans really are li like the Italians of the Orient. So they're very, you know, very emotional, very musical. Now you find yourself uh, in California, not only for the festival, but now you live on the West Coast, right? And you teach uh, in LA, that's sort of your latest, right? One of, one of your, uh, yes. so tell, tell me, because I know you, you taught uh, uh, first, wasn't it in uh, New England Conservatory? Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, did you teach? No, at uh, Rutgers. Well, first, my very first uh, teaching position was in Boston. And then I uh, went to Germany, taught in Dresden, Hochschule okay. for Music, for three years or two years, three years, I think. And then I, um, I had a kind of interim position at Rutgers University. And then now I am very happy to be in Los Angeles at the University of Southern California. And, um, you know, this is my second year. We just started our semester all online, um, as, as a lot of schools are doing. And, um, yeah, it's, uh, I learned so much from my students. And I, I know that I'm there to teach, but I'm amazed at how much I'm learning from them, not only as musicians, but as human beings. You know, I, I, every time I finish my teaching day, of course I'm exhausted, but I'm just, my heart is completely, completely full at how much these you know um students have to give and and their curiosity and their and they're they're just i'm so hopeful when i see these good human beings take the responsibility to become great artists and and it's a beautiful thing to witness and i'm i, I feel very lucky to be part of it because and, and, and I have to say, the biggest gift of teaching is finding new, like newfound love for repertoire that I've been knowing for years. I remember the first time I, 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 I heard a piece that I, I have to admit I didn't, wasn't too crazy about. And then while I was teaching it, I was like, wait a minute, there's so much beauty in this piece that I just didn't bother to look closely enough. And you know what? Like, thanks to the student, I found that beauty again.
Tell me, uh, in, in terms of, uh, now you've had an experience, I mean, it was very early as you, as you described, just first nine years ago in Korea. But then of course you, you've had a lot of trips and even some of your teachers uh, are from Europe, not only the, uh, Ms. DeLay, and then I think Miriam Fried was one, uh, was one of your uh, teachers, but you also studied especially viola in Europe, right? So what's the difference in the ways of teaching uh, that Europeans in this case, let's say Kronberg Academy or uh, Thomas Riebel was where? In Salzburg or where was he teaching? Because he Yeah, uh, Thomas Riebel's in Salzburg and then Nobuko Imai yeah. was my teacher in Kronberg and also Anna Chmachenko, I, who I uh, was lucky to study violin with uh, at the same time. And I guess, um, uh, I don't know if it's a difference between Europe and America or that I was a little bit older, so I took it differently. But I felt like there was a, um, how do I say it? Less was said, but more was felt, I suppose, is how I would say it. Um, I, you know, I could, every word that Nobuko has said, I remember it quite clearly, because partially because she said so little, but everything she said was, was so potent. And um, I think I was also at an age where, you know, as, as, as students, all students, I believe, should always make their own choices at some point, either in school or after school, what they've learned, they have to choose what works for them and, you know, stay with that. But it's their choice. And I was making that choices almost as I was learning. I think it's partially because I was older. But um, Miriam Freed was a kind of a crucial point in my life when I went to her, I think I was 15. Miriam Fried and her husband, Paul Biss, were my mentors, and they still are. I mean, I was just texting them a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And they're the kind of people that I want to reach out to when something good happens or when something difficult happens. They become a, like, I, you know, they, they, they're, they care in such a intimate way. And, and, and I really am grateful for that because I was at a very lost point. Like, I was performing, performing, and performing, and then who am I? And that's when I got to meet Miriam and Paul and I relearned the love of music and how I should think about music. It, it's like, almost like I, I found my head again, my, my, my intelligence again. So, you know, that was very important for me. And the, the four years that I had with them was very uh, methodical because I was really learning to think about music in a different way. And I, you know, I was lucky to be really in school and see them regularly. So that was great. And then um, I started performing more and more and more again. And then I, I, um, I went to Prussia Cove. You know, it's like almost, almost like a, how do, should I say music festival or music seminar in the Land's End and the Cornwall in UK. Beautiful, beautiful surrounding. And that's where I got to hear uh, Andra Schiff teach and Radosh, Ferenc Radosh. And, you know, the, re like the, the Chandraveg school of thinking, really, and living. And that's, I also got to meet Thomas Riebel there. And um, he uh, had a completely different way. Like he, I remember in Salzburg, he basically, I wouldn't say didn't let me, but encouraged me not to vibrate for a whole year. And, you know, I used to think, oh, what is this? But now I get it. I needed to know what the palette was from no vibrato to a lot of vibrato so that I can make a choice because I was doing things kind of out of autopilot and I was living in kind of an autopilot again so he he kind of reset me in that way and then I my the very last teachers were Chumachenko and Nobuko and I'm, I'm I'm very very grateful for that because uh they kind of uh um, made me think about music in a more complete way so you know as you know when you live life each person means something different to you but just you know not one less essential than the other and i like to say that i'm a rich person in terms of human relationships because i've just been so lucky to have met those mentors um at the right time at the right place and you know that's sometimes uh, what weighs on me when i'm a when i'm a teacher like i know how much my teachers meant to me so 
I just hope to be as half as good as my teachers were now that I'm a teacher myself. And, and it's very humbling. Let me tell you, I remember the first like few weeks that I taught, I texted my former teachers and I was like, I'm sorry, I was such a bad student. Now I get it. <laughs> it's very it's like, frustrating I, get, I get what you went through. And you yeah. feel like a failure. If they don't get certain things or you keep, you have to keep repeating the same things. You think, well, am I making myself clear? What's, what's the matter? Why, why he or she does not get it. And what's the, and the next day, the time lesson, and it's still there. And you think, Oh my God, I'm a failure as a teacher. But I must say that it also takes a special person like you who has a multitude of talents and who has a very wide, uh, sphere of interest you're not just just a string player just you know fingerboard and everything has to be perfect you really absorb a lot and that's why you were given so much because you were able to receive it I just wanted to, I think you, you, you've made a very, very, you've made a many wonderful programs, but one was fortunately captured on, on video. And that was in one of the Chambered Festivals, right? In Cleveland, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, I love the, 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 the title of it and also the content. Uh, Telling Fiddle Tales, which has a program of violin solo in so many different incarnations and in so many different things and there's a pre-Bach very old composer Bieber the beautiful Passacaglia you were talking about you know Thomas Riebel and how he made you play with no vibrato and for this music it would be so you know talk a little bit about that program and of course I'll be able to even before we talk about it I will put some things uh you know in our program but uh Talk, talk how how you came about to this to this program, which I find very very uh, interesting and uh, satisfying. Well, it's a reflection of how I think about music at that certain time, which is that I felt finally free as a, not only as a violinist, but I felt like a musician. Like no matter what instrument I would play, that music is in my blood. It's not about the instrument anymore. Instrument is a tool and it's a wonderful tool to have a voice but for me uh, vi violin I was not limited to the 200 years of repertoire anymore I was just I just wanted to express myself in, in very different ways and I found that Bieber's music was so pure and so ethereal in a way that I didn't get to experience as a student and I was so completely taken with it. And it just makes your instrument sing and it just vibrates. Like you, you, we mentioned the, before the talk about overtones. I mean, that music just, just encourages the overtones that you've, you know, you, you think you haven't heard before. So I wanted to open with that. And I wanted to close the program with, you know, the ultimate Pierre de Resistance, the resistance of the violin repertoire, Chacon, because how can you not? But within that arc, of the of the you know because the beeper starts with four notes the g uh, g f e uh, d and it's the most simplest way right and the chacon in a way is very complex but also very simple it's, it's based yeah. on one theme and it's just so in a way i wanted to express how simple and how complex the music can be but through different regions as well you know um with the uh, movement by unesco you hear 
like uh, Romanian folk music and, and, and folk fiddling. I wanted to go a little bit to Scandinavia. I wanted to go to um, 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 uh, America. I unfortunately couldn't find anything from Mongolia, but I almost went there. You know, anywhere there was string and bow and how it was expressed, I wanted to find what music there was to explore. And the most fun thing about that program was how different it made me play, but with the same heart. It's almost like, like, like you have a tree, you have a root, but you're kind of growing branches and you're enjoying the fruit of your, you know, the, the, the fruit of the growth in a way. And um, some of the repertoire, actually all of the repertoire required great technical expertise, which is something that uh, we should all, you know, have, but in a, it didn't become a foreground. It become like the, 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 the nourishment in order for this music to be expressed. But before that, just a few months before, I think you finished your uh, competition circus, a circle. It's, it is a kind of a circle. <laughs> same, kind <laughs> so of Freudian the same. Slip, yeah. <laughs> Freudian slip there. Freudian. Freudian slip, exactly. But yours was very, very impressive. Impressive finish. I was sitting at the IR Day. It's a big uh, radio competition in Munich. And uh, I was judging the violinists. And it's, it's for some reason, it's a tradition at that competition, they have at least four different disciplines. At that point, there was uh, chamber music, a, a violin, viola, and maybe bassoon or something like that, one of the wind instruments. And they only, I don't know why, but they only <laughs> award one first prize. So the, the, the recipient of that prize is always, and you know, very often it's a violinist or a pianist if there's a, but this time, when I found out, and I heard, of course, we met for breakfast with other jury members, and I saw my old friend Gerard Cosset, who was, and I said, who, who is there? I said, well, there's you early. I said, ah, now we have a real candidate. And then Bob Levin, who is a good, dear friend, uh, he was the president of the, of the viola uh, jury. So just before the final, and by that time, it was quite clear that there was no uh, clear winner among the violinists or no candidate. I literally, I, I went to talk to Bob and I said, Bob, if you don't give Yuri Lee the first prize, I'll never talk to you again. <laughs> of course I was, okay. <laughs> but they did. They didn't have to have my encouragement because they knew that you would have won the violin competition as well if you entered. And I think at some point you thought about it, but you did the right thing that you entered viola. And so I'd love to hear, or maybe finish the program with a, with a bit of a Stamets uh, viola concerto, which you play in the semifinal of that competition. And there you are with the chamber orchestra. It's a beautiful, beautiful playing. <laughs> to be honest, between you, you and I, well, and it's not a secret. I you, went to you, ARD because I wanted to play, I've never played viola with orchestra before. And I wanted to play with orchestra. That's the, that's the course. reason. And I, I wanted to be BR. So that's why I went. And the first time I played the Stamitz and the Bartok were the very first moments I've ever played with viola and orchestra. Because, you know, viola, as you know, we don't get to play concertos very often. So, yeah, it, I think that's maybe one of the reasons why I did so well, because I was just there to play music. Absolutely. But I think even before the semifinal, it was quite clear that you were going to be, you were head and shoulders above. And we, we were saying in the violin uh, jury, that if you were played for the violin competition, she would have gotten first prize. 
anyway here. But I think it was more because I don't think ever since Bashmet, and we're talking about mid 70s, uh, for many, many years, there was no violist overall winner. So it's, it's a tribute to your artistry, to your extraordinary also endurance, because to, to have, you know, and you're 35, a baby, but you've lived already a very, very eventful life and you reinvented yourself a number of times and you stayed strong and uh, really an example of how to be not only a great artist, but also a great human being. So bravo to you, Yura. I can't wait to see you in January in Greensboro and uh, enjoy your uh, La Jolla town because it's a beautiful town. And let's hope this, this virus just will go away someplace and let the music begin. Thank you so much for your kind words. It means a lot to me because, you know, you're one of those musicians that we look all look up to and be inspired by. So it means especially a lot. And I'm so happy that you would have me back in Greensboro and I can't wait. I really can't wait. And I'm, I'm, this talk has been a very heartwarming talk for just to be able to see you and to talk to you and talk about music has been really great. So thank you. Thank you, and see you in January. Have a wonderful rehearsal on a great time in La Jolla. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Stay safe.